Hello, everyone, and welcome to Meet the Experts, Youth Action for Collective Climate Justice. I'm Katie Wolfson with the UCAR Center for Science Education, and I am so excited to welcome all of you to here today. This Meet the Experts is a special event that is part of the worldwide teaching on climate and justice. So this event has been holding events worldwide, um, and we have a little welcome video here from the organizers of the worldwide teaching to welcome us in today. Welcome to the worldwide teaching in on climate and justice. You are joining tens of thousands of students at hundreds of schools across the planet in learning and thinking about the work each of you can do now and in your future to repair the climate and lead a just transition to a clean energy future. Your worldwide teaching will mobilize the power of educators and students and empower a generation of fighting to stabilize the climate and advance climate injustice. We all need to get comfortable talking about climate all the time. The teaching helps us do that. The Worldwide Teach In is a call to organize events on campus or community on or around March 29, 2023. The key to a successful teaching is relying on homegrown talent, not outside experts. We all need to step up. The biggest threat to your future is thinking that somehow someone else is going to stop global warming. This is the great work of our generation. We hope this teaching will help you find your own pathway to repairing the climate. And we are so thrilled to have everyone joining us today. We have folks on today with us from parts of the US, from Colorado, California, Wisconsin, New York, Georgia, uh, Tennessee. We also have folks in other countries from Zimbabwe, Kenya, India, and Bangladesh on with us today. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Meet the Experts is a monthly program here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research where we connect you to experts doing work in earth system science, climate, and weather. And today we have a really amazing climate expert, uh, an expert in taking climate action today. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our speaker in just a moment, but a few things just to make sure everyone knows how they can interact or let us know if they need any support in today. You can type in the chat if you need support with anything at all, or if you have a comment or a question for Madvi, our speaker. So feel free to type that in the chat. There is also a Q&A function if you feel more comfortable submitting a question in that Q&A. So feel free to type that in. Um, um, there is also closed captioning available if you'd like to turn that on and off. So um, let us know if you need anything at all. But without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our amazing speaker today. So today our expert is an expert on taking climate action. Madhvi Chatur, also known as the No Styrofoam Ninja, is the youngest UN child advisor at 12 years old. She is the founder of Madhvi for Ecoethics and the Global Ecoethics Movement and was voted Best Upcoming Peacemaker by 14 Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Madhvi has been a passionate climate warrior and zero waste champion since the age of five. She has brought about large many, many large-scale policy changes through her activism at the local, national, and global weather, or global le level. So welcome, Madvi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, hello, everyone. And yeah, thank you, Katie. And uh, before we start um, today's climate justice discussion, um, I just want to tell a joke. So Person A asked, can you give an example of climate justice negotiations between two parties or nations? Then person B quips, it's like a small ATM room having two ACs and four tube lights working 24 hours, asking me not a printer receipt to save the environment. Yeah, <laughs> you can continue. Awesome. Thank you so much for starting us off with a joke. Um, so as um, as a, as a uh, climate warrior, you've been part of many, many campaigns. Um, for the students and folks joining us today, can you kind of share some big picture examples of the type of work that you do? Yes. So now I have been a climate warrior activist since five years of age. 
And I fight for every living being's fundamental right to clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean food, and great health for my generation and future generations. And uh, now it's April, so uh, let me start with some policy successes that have uh, happened in April. So number one, I worked with Congressman Promoter and Governor Hickenlooper to declare April as Plastic and Styrofoam Pollution Awareness Month when I was six years old. And two, uh, with like Madam VP Kamala Harris on the global plastic policy, it was backed by 75 countries and many signatories like climate scientists, uh, Michael Mann, um, and then like country, uh, countries and like my, and then, you know, former, you know, current uh, heads of states, educationists, um, artists, activists, uh, farmers, ranchers, LGBTQ plus people, um, people of color, etc. cetera. Uh, number three, I work with the EPA waterhead, Ms. Radhika Fox uh, and the EPA to uh, reduce uh, PFAS guidance limits in drinking water and make them uh, legally enforceable. Uh, number four, uh, I spearheaded the ban of plastic bags and styrofoam containers in all restaurants uh, in Colorado. Uh, this law has like, already been partially implemented since uh, January 2023. Uh, it has a 10 cent charge fee on plastic bags in Colorado. And uh, from 2024, uh, January now, no restaurant or cafeteria will offer a styrofoam takeout containers in plastic bags. And isn't that wonderful? And I am still really thrilled that it's a law. And uh, number five, I have worked with uh, the Governor Polis to declare March as PFAS uh, Pollution Impact Awareness Month. Uh, six, I spearheaded the ban of PFAS in consumer products in Colorado. And uh, number seven, and my suggestions were implemented as rules in the oil and gas permit process for conserving, conserving surface, storm, and groundwater uh, by COGCC, which is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Oh my gosh, just a few mm -hmm. things you've been working on, right? <laughs> yeah, just a few things. Yeah. I've done a lot, right? It's amazing. It's amazing. So so with all of these amazing things that you've done, all these policies you've been involved with, all these campaigns, what, what inspired you to begin your climate work and your activism? Okay, so when I was five years old, I was watching this uh, CNN documentary with my family. It was called, it was titled Midway, the Plastic Island. And it was aired when President Obama was visiting uh, the island to inaugurate the Midway Atoll National Refuge. So this documentary was really sad. It showed like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, heaps of plastic trash in the shores of Midway Island, birds like albatross scooping plastic along with their prey, feeding it to their chicks. There was a big styrofoam ball floating and pieces pulled off from it by ocean waves. Uh, like birds were dying because plastics are in their stomachs. Their bodies decompose, but the plastic is still there. And the sad thing is that Midway Island is like in the middle of nowhere. It's far, far away from civilization in the Pacific Ocean but all the trash is on its shores. And that this has inspired me to take action. Amazing, amazing. So um, you have been, you, you were inspired by this documentary. You're kind of, sounds like kind of horrified, right? As a lot of us would be for the, with this, right, that this is happening right, in the world, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so that really drove you to, to get involved and take action. Um, so I introduced you at the start, um, actually, well, to get, to take action, you got, before you even got involved in more campaigns, at six years old, you started your own nonprofit. Right. So can you right. tell us a bit about Mod V for Ecoethics and kind of what your mission is? Yeah, yeah, yes. So actually, I started Mod V for Ecoethics like less than a year since I had published uh, my book called Is Plastic My Food? And that's when I wanted to do more and like create a large scale impact. So I founded this 501c3 nonprofit called Mod V for Ecoethics. So its mission is to usher impactful change 
uh, advocating ecoethics and enabling green choices in lieu of non-green convenience and greedy economics um, to protect ecosystem, public health, and climate. So I am also the founder of the Ecoethics Global Movement uh, in 2020. Its purpose is to educate and train children, uh, youth, and adults on like climate justice and climate activism, uh, and also provide support to them in their like local projects that are aligned with the mission of Modvi for ecoethics. So yeah, the mission. Wow, wow. So, um, so, so lots of work, lots of great um, things that you're doing with that nonprofit. Um, that, that's really, um, really, really neat that you founded that nonprofit um, and that you're continuing to do so much work through that. Uh, so you've been involved with lots of different campaigns. You kind of gave us an idea of some of those at the start. And at the start, I also introduced you, and I believe your shirt shows us, uh, mentions No Styrofoam Ninja, right? So where did that name come from? Uh, yeah, so um, so I actually started learning Taekwondo in 2016 when I was five years old, and now I am a black belt. So when I was learning Taekwondo, we were called as ninjas. So I decided to like coin these slogans for like, or like catchphrases for like my campaigns. Uh, for example, recycle, reverse sidekick, and the no star from Ninja, let me show you. I'm wearing a shirt which has no star from Ninja on it. And um, it's to raise awareness. So for, you know, that's my Styrofoam lunch tray campaign. I actually coined the No Styrofoam Ninja. I want everyone, I wanted everyone to transform themselves into ninjas and then uh, re refuse Styrofoam plates and then instead use sustainable alternatives like uh, stainless steel or paper trays. Amazing. We actually have a video of you calling other people to action for World Environment Day back in June 2018. Right. On this World Environment Day, I pledge to be placed singly on styrofoam plates with paper or stainless steel plates. Join me in this! So your activism has spanned from videos like that to right to giving to giving speeches and talks in front of the UN uh, just a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah, right, right. Amazing. Um, and so, so you um, have a lot of your campaigns have kind of kind of stemming from that inspiration, right, around the Midway Island um, plastic crisis there that you have um, been involved with the Colorado plastic spill. Can you tell me a bit more about how you were involved with that and what your work was? Yeah, so I decided to like um, create like a greater impact across Colorado to tackle uh, unnecessary plastic pollution. Uh, so in May 19th, I started a campaign to bring about a bill uh, to ban plastic bags and styrofoam containers in restaurants and cafeterias in the state capital steps. And after my campaign speech, a uh, a zero waste committee was like was formed by legislators in June 2019. Uh, then I gave like many uh, public speeches. I also collected like 3,000 signatures. Um, in January 2020, bill the bills were introduced, but COVID struck, so uh, they were postponed and then they were introduced in 2021. It was as one bill, HB 21162 in the 2021 legislative session. So I kept the momentum for the bill by organizing three river cleanups, um, like meeting and then like emailing uh, legislators and like around like 35 mayors across Colorado. Um, I gave many testimonies before the various uh, legislative committees on some like even at like 1 a.m. in the night. Uh, finally, that bill passed both the House, the Senate and then signed into law um, uh, by Governor Polis on July 6th. And I was really thrilled about that. Um, yeah, on uh, July 6th, 2021, that uh, Governor Polis signed the law 
sign the bill into law. So I'm still like really thrilled. Uh, and also Governor Polis gave this bill signing uh, pen as a memento to me. And the bill goes into uh, f effect fully in June 2024. I've repeated this already. So that's it. Wow. Wow. So, so you're, that's kind of an example of, right, that statewide bill that you were involved with. You were giving testimonies, you were organizing river cleanups, um, and you were there for the bill signing, um, which is so, so exciting. So uh, through all of this kind of work across the state, what kind of changes have you been working on on a more local level, maybe in your own schools? Um, have you been kind of working on some, a campaign related to your school too? Oh, yes, I am. Uh, yes, I did. So just after finishing my book, It, it Plastic My Food, I wanted to do more. So I met with uh, U.S. Congressman Mr. Ed Perlmutter and then worked with Governor uh, Mr. Higginlooper to declare April as Plastic and Styrofoam Pollution Awareness Month. I said this already. And uh, then I became like concerned that uh, the students were eating out of these styrofoam uh, trays in school cafeterias. So it's a really big problem problem because styrofoam is a uh, type plastic six and it is not biodegradable. It just breaks down into small pieces and then contaminates soil, water, air, and even like wildlife eats it, they eat it. It's a big problem. And it's also carcinogenic because uh, there's a chemical in styrofoam called styrene. And that leaches into our food and co in context, especially uh, when the food is hot. Thus, it is so bad for the environment and it risks the health of uh, students. So that's why I decided to tackle it. I wrote a letter to the then superintendent of Jeffco Public Schools, uh, Dr. Jason Glass, and also started um, my signature campaign uh, to eliminate them. I collected around like 1,000 signatures. Then he set up a task force. I convinced uh, him that I wanted to be part uh, of the task force and I attended every single meeting. Uh, we discussed many things, you know, cost, suppliers, etc. And then after like nearly one year of uh, meetings and one year of nonstop uh, work and like many school visits, the switch finally happened in September 2019 in, wall, in all 155 schools, impacting 86,000 students. Um, and it eliminated nearly, it's eliminating nearly like 25 million, I guess, styrofoam trays from going to the landfill till date. Wow, incredible. Uh, and, yeah, it also saved like the health of the students and yeah, that's how I created an impact in like my school district locally. And did you did you know, like, did you get a final word from them saying like, OK, we're going to make this change or was it more of a surprise? It is actually yeah, a big surprise. I was in like September. So I was just went to school and then at lunch, some of my friends were eating school lunch and I saw they were using paper trays and it was so surprising. I even told my parents, look, they finally did the, the, the switch and it was so sudden. Uh, I was really, really happy when I found out. What a, what a fun surprise to show up in the lunchroom right? and to see, right. see that right of all your work coming together. Um, <clears throat> So it sounds like making those changes took a lot of perseverance on your part, right? One student kind of, you were attending all of those meetings, you were writing letters, um, you were just kept pushing for that change until you saw it. Um, so sometimes it takes one voice, right? Sometimes all it takes is one voice persevering. But sometimes in climate, and in climate justice, it takes a much bigger group and collective action from all of us. So what's an example of some campaigns that you've done where you've kind of had to work with a broader team or bring in your classmates to help you with that more yes so with this i actually said a guinness book uh guinness book of world records so in 2018 i started the every school a green school campaign and i wanted to do something where i can add value and then i saw like markers and pens they go to the landfill after the ink is used up so 
thought of maybe attempting like a Guinness uh, World Record for recycling markers uh, by like involving many schools and students. So this way everybody learns about recycling, plastic pollution, and at the same time they can also get into the Guinness Book of World Records. So, um, so it also encourages to students and it's a win-win situation for everything, for all. Uh, I organized this small launch function and then students became motivated and joined me. And actually they volunteered in marker uh, collection and counting. So I wrote emails to principals and even like to the teachers. Um, I printed bilingual posters in English, Spanish. I distributed like collection bins uh, to and bo or boxes to like all the schools, etc. And that took uh, nearly one year um, for the schools to like confirm their participation. I uh, called and even talked to the teachers like like in my drive time till <laughs> till I get to school and like to and from school in the car and reminding them to put like all the rules, et cetera, like, yeah. But then COVID struck and so we postponed it to 2021 and held it on December 3rd, 2021. So yeah, it's a community uh, effort, a weighing scale business named uh, Colorado Scale Tenor. They donated their time and industrial scales to weigh the markers uh, and also like certify the weighings as per Guinness World, Guinness World Record specifications. Uh, then Huntington Bank also, uh, uh, like, you know, those officials and my uh, late music teacher, uh, Ms. Mary Fraser and an army veteran uh, also all served as like uh, witnesses. Finally, it took one year uh, for the Guinness World Records to award it, award the record. And let me show you. We have it there. Look at that. <laughs> That's so great. And An official Guinness World Record set. <laughs> So we actually collected 22,637 uh, markers and it weighed 440 pounds. Wow. Wow. What an amazing example, yeah. right? To kind of share that with other schools um, or other organizations or communities, right? It's a great example of where you were like, I'm going to, rather than just me recycling my markers, how can I invite my classmates, right? How can I invite my school? How can I invite other schools in the district, right? Of growing that out. Um, and I love your insight into kind of having that world record goal as a motivating factor. Yeah. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Like 21 schools participated and and the record was most markers collected for recycling in one hour. Amazing. Yeah. Um, that's great. amazing. I, I see that um, one of our participants is raising a hand. If you have a question, I would love if you would type it in the chat and we can read that out to Madby. Feel free, anybody who's watching with us, if you have questions or comments or something that you want to share, type that in the chat um, and we will get that to Madby because I would love to know what you're wondering there. Um, so, Madhvi, you um, have, after kind of these, you know, big statewide policy, um, as well as this like local school wide change that or schools school change that you've seen in your district to setting records. I think you might have some good advice to share with students um, or just other adults, too, that are watching with us today. What advice do you have for other students and people who want to get involved in climate work? Oh, first, before I answer this, I want to show you how the compostable tray looks like after I did the switch. Here it is. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. And now I'll answer it. So I actually have like five tips and that I want to give to the students um, who want to just get involved in climate work. So number one is to know the problem well. I have uh, researched like a lot about plastic pollution as well as like PFAS pollution, etc. to just know about the problem and what to do about it. Uh, and never, number two is to never uh, fear criticism or failure. Failure. You know, I faced uh, criticism in like social media, like next door, but that I did that did not stop me, and I continued to, to do my work. 
So number three, it's to keep persevering. I had to um, fight a lot to do, like, for example, like my plastic bill and even uh, like the the Guinness Book uh, World Record, the Guinness World Record, etc. I had to work really hard to get that. It took like literally one year to get that also. Um, number four is to uh, basically like raise awareness. You know, I've done like many climate rallies, done many speeches. Um, I even did one to like the UN General Assembly recently. I've done like, you know, yes, signature campaigns. I've emailed many legislators, etc. And uh, number f five is to team up to solve. Um, we should all come together, like all activists uh, should come together. And then with that, uh, with that collective action, we can solve this, we can solve the problem. Yeah, right, like not one those person. Those are all my tips. Those are, those are really, really great tips, Mavi. I love that you have those um, kind of organized into those. And, and you're absolutely right, right? Not one person is going to fix everything, right? Not one policy right, is right. going to change everything, right? So we need all the voices in the room coming together. Um, and yes. we, um, so we need, we need your voice. We need indigenous voices. We need scientist voices. We need um, voices of disabled community. We need all sorts of voices in this conversation um, right. in order right. to create that just world. So um, what's next for you? What's next for you? Um, what kind of campaign are you most focused on right now? So, okay, so, okay, one second. So I just want to like, you know how I did the PFAS bill uh, to uh, ban PFAS and uh, consumer products? I want uh, to. I want everyone to ban PFAS in every product, um, globally, all over the world. That's what I'm uh, working on right now. And how does how does PFAS even like come? yeah? I, I spoke about that in the UN General Assembly. I addressed them and I spoke to them about that. So that was just recently. So, so how does PFAS pollution affect people? Um, like, why is it a, a climate justice issue? Yeah. So, basically, like, there's there are these marginalized uh, communities. They're basically uh, near the uh, they're near the source of pollution, and they're like uh, women, uh, children. Uh, like a disabled people, LGBTQ people, BIPOC, and it's just a big problem. And PFAS, it's just a big, uh, it's a very carcinogenic, uh, human-made chemical, and it uh, pollutes everything, pollutes our air, our water, our soil. It bioaccumulates into our food. And um, it's just a big problem now. And they stand for per and polyfluoroalkyls. So it's just a, a very big problem. It's in many different products, uh, waterproof, uh, greaseproof, heatproof products. Uh, they are okay. And, and so it's a big problem. There are marginalized communities, like I said, women, children, pregnant people, um, like older people, people with already uh, existing health conditions, BIPOC like me, um, and like LGBTQ, indigenous communities, et cetera, they're all marginalized. They cannot always get the care they need. They're even like closer uh, to the source of pollution. And so, and then sometimes if, as like for example me, I'm a girl as well as like a child and BIPOC, which means it's more marginalization. So. That's why it's like a big problem for like climate justice and it's linked, yeah. And so, so absolutely. So, so sounds like a really powerful campaign. What kind of things have you been doing to get the word out? You've been giving, you've been giving that talk at the UN. Um, have you been doing, what other actions have you been taking around PFAS? So yeah, I've done like, um, 
like even more signature campaign to be uh, ban PFAS. I even did like a seminar recently on March 23rd, 23rd. Um, and like Philippe Grandjean, which is a, a very, I like a professor and uh, University of Rhode Island, he came and he was the chief guest of honor and like stuff like that. I even did another uh, PFAS seminar in like 2020, 2022. Mm. So you're kind of organizing those seminars and those information sessions to kind of bring together experts to talk about it, right? Yes, so it and like that will be to just raise awareness because many people still uh, do not know uh, what PFAS is, what to do about it. Um, yeah, I even brought farmers, ranchers, and like the main, the State of Maine Farmers Association, uh, many organizations, et cetera. Yeah, so it sounds like through all this climate action work, you've worked with a lot of different people, a lot of different types of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you share a bit more of kind of that that diversity of people that you get to work with in the work that you do? So like the different people that I've met or worked mm -hmm. with? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've worked with like many uh, activists, like other activists, for example, uh, Greta Thunberg, then uh, scientists like Dr. Michael Mann, Dr. Jane Goodall, at, like many government heads, uh, legislators, uh, like, you know, former and current ones as well, like VP Harris, uh, former VP Al Gore, uh, Rosalia Arteaga, et cetera. So, yeah, then educationists, uh, diplomats, you know, like Eric Solheim, uh, like professors, like Philippe Grandchamp, artists, and even like my own classmates and other youth. Uh, and then indigenous uh, communities uh, like Ute and uh, Lakota Nation people, uh, and like any public committees, uh, disabled people, athletes, um, you know, for example, like Hollywood uh, stuntmen, um, Master Mike Chat, and et cetera. There are many. So thus my work has like, um, has allowed me to meet uh, many different people from many different uh, backgrounds, like, you know, race, religion, culture, and like many people from uh, different countries, et cetera. Yeah, because we're, we're all being affected, right, by climate change. We're not yeah. all being affected It equally. has no borders and it affects, it affects all. Yeah, so every, everybody has, has a voice in there. Everyone can have a say in that. Um, everybody can take action, right? In whatever their whatever their profession is, wherever they're focused. Um, so, do you have um, where I'm going to open it up for questions um, in the chat now for yeah. anybody who has questions as we go into that? Um, we do have one comment in the chat of Julie saying, "Thank you so much. Thank you, Madvi, for all your work for, uh, for the community." Um, so, just wanted to share that thanks uh, from Julie in the chat. Uh, but I'm curious if any of our audience have any questions for Madvi uh, that you want to type in there. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, I was curious, Madvi, with all these different folks that you're talking to, um, do you ever get nervous giving speeches at rallies or talking to these politicians? <laughs> Um, not really. Um, I've done many speeches and I'm also very like kind and polite as well as firm with my remarks. So no, I'm not, I'm not nervous when I speak to like, when I speak or go into speeches like that. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, do you have any tips for students or uh, people who, who are nervous uh, to speak to those folks or to raise their voice up? You just have, yeah, you just have to be yourself and uh, you don't need to worry um, about like about other people. You just need to yeah be yourself and every and always. And yeah. Do you have and then like, you know, and then, you know, it's like stay, say your own story, um, say what you know about the problem, what you are what you want to say to the public. That's it. Yeah, yeah, kind of coming back to those five tips that yeah. you gave us earlier, right? Um, yeah. Kind of know what you want to talk about. Don't, yes. don't give Do in to any research. criticism. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, do you have any, like, uh, climate work is so, can be so challenging and so overwhelming, right? But also can be so rewarding. Do you have any favorite parts of doing climate work that kind of, that you, 
What's your what's your kind of favorite part of the work that you do? Uh, the favorite part for me is just uh, meeting other people. Like I said, I'm very happy that I was able to meet uh, many different people from like many different uh, backgrounds. And so that is uh, my favorite. Uh, that is my favorite part. And, you know, like convincing them to do like to, to like do. Yeah, to just take action, basically. Okay. Yeah. Just working with all those different people and taking action. I love that. Um, what's yeah. what's the most challenging part of climate work for you? So I want to say um, so that um, right now, since I'm since like I'm born in the U.S., I do not get any grants. I don't really have a say. Um, I don't get like space to speak, so I have to fight a lot to uh, sp like speak with the, these um, legislators and people like that. So, because like um, other people, they favor like people from uh, like Asia, the global south, um, and they get to they get all these opportunities for conferences. But I do, I do not get that because I'm uh, American and born in the U.S. Gotcha. So that, so, so there's some barriers there that you're trying to find ways to to get the word out more or to get involved in some yeah. of those actions. Yes. Gotcha. What? So we talked earlier about what motivated you to get started in your climate work. Um, what kinds of things motivate you to keep going in your work? Is it the same motivation? It's basic. It's just my passion, and I'm just always motivated to do something. I never get demotivated about it. So we, so so, it's never lo losing that momentum. I love that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you get to travel with the work that you do? Yeah. So. I do actually, yeah, as I said before, I do get to travel like, like I was able to meet many people. I travel to me like, not all the time, but like twice a year, mostly like that. So I do get the opportunity to travel and meet different people. Really neat. Where, where are some of the places that you've traveled to? Um. Yeah, so like, for example, I traveled like very, very widely in North America, for example, like US, uh, Mexico, then like in Europe, uh, like the UK, Italy, uh, Germany, Portugal, Spain, uh, Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, and then like in India, etc. So everywhere I go, I always try to uh, raise awareness and be an ambassador uh, for change to protect our our ecosystems and um, and to raise my voice um, against plastic pollution. Amazing, amazing. And those are some incredible places that you've gotten to travel all over kind of doing this work and, and, and sharing that message. Um, and when you're not, you know, share, when you're not doing your climate work um, and writing letters and testifying for bills, um, what kinds of things do you like to do outside of your climate work? Do you have any hobbies so, or things that you like to do? So, uh, yeah, I just like to kind of compose music. I have like an album uh, called I Am Prince's Genius. It's my first album. I also like play piano, violin, clarinet, recorder, uh, guitar, uh, viola, etc. So I really like doing uh, music. I also am an author. I have um, so far published six books and they're all in like Amazon. So, yeah. Wow. So you, you just seem to take this vision. You have a vision, whether it's a piece of music, a book that you want to see done, a ch policy you want to see changed. And I'm seeing this theme of that you, you just envision something and then you, you manifest it. 
right? So you are taking that vision, you are creating something, whether it's a craft, a music album, um, or a policy change of banning plastic bags, uh, or you know, getting up in front of the UN Water Conference and, and telling them about PFAS. Uh, that's incredible, Madvi. Thank you, thank you. Well, we are just about out of time here. Um, so I want okay. to, um, Madvi, I want to ask, do you have any final advice for the folks watching today before we say goodbye? So yeah, I do have some closing remarks. So uh, hello everyone in this session so far, you would have seen like the climate justice factor they p play out. So for example, like my drive to re replace styrofoam lunch trays uh, in schools. It was like a matter of health justice, environmental justice, and intergenerational justice. Um, I mentioned, you know, farmers, ranchers, indigenous people, uh, BIPOC, LGBTQ, uh, disabled persons, uh, women, children, and like marginalized communities in my journey story. Everyone is impacted differently by the climate crisis in different ways. So yeah, Climate justice to me is like a combination of environmental, social, uh, economic, racial, health, and intergenerational justice. Yeah, I also want to say uh, my eco-ethics movement is, you know, in many countries, for example, India, U.S., Bangladesh, um, Argentina, Gambia, Mozambique, uh, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, uh, et cetera. So, and also, and we all have, we all come together and it's uh, very great. Also, um, I also thank uh, everyone for spending your time with me to know about climate justice in action. It is like, it is a big, a humongous issue and like many questions can come up in your minds. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, via uh, my email in my website or via social media. You can also join uh, the Mod V for Ecoethics Facebook or WhatsApp groups and then volunteer for the Ecoethics Global Movement. So I believe that like Katie should be sending uh, a few links. So please join and everyone repeat after me. There is no planet B. Refuse okay. plastics, save life elements. Marvel. Thank you so much. Those links are in the chat and also we will send them out in an email after that. Um, great, great final message there, Madhvi. Um, thank you so much. Um, and for everybody um, who's watching today, we want to invite you to join us again later this evening. We're going to do a second session this, uh, this evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Time featuring two other uh, climate activists, Phoebe Dominguez and Maya Bovino. So join us again this evening if you want to check out that, join the conversation there, hear about some other action being taken. But without further ado, I just want to thank you so much, Madhvi, for joining us today, uh, for sharing mm -hmm. your story, for sharing your action that you're taking, for uh, inspiring folks in ways that they can take actions too. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Namaste, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, everyone.